in the cash money situation, they had the artist with the talent and they had the ownership that was willing to do what it took to make it work because they saw a big picture for themselves. Yeah, we on Boss Talk 101. 101. Yeah, we gonna talk. Well, Birdman, I talked to him on the phone, and uh, I, the one thing that he credits you for is their work, his work ethic in the uh, uh, studio. Yeah. That's something I didn't even see coming. I Believe me, we done interviewed at Sharani's and all kind of stuff at Peaches. She mentioned you in the, yes. in the interview. Everybody we talked to, it, we get an IUGK moment, okay? Mm -hmm. But... That was something that kind of caught me off guard. You know, when he said that, I knew y'all had ties, but just those type of ties early on, how would you, how would, how does that make you feel when you hear him say something like that? Well, I mean, look, I, I've, I've been able to build a lot of relationships with a lot of people. Okay. Right? And one thing that you'll hear universally is that everybody met the same dude. That's right. Real. Then you're not going to hear people say they met a different version of Bun B. All of them going to say pretty much the same thing about me if you ask them the same question. You know what I'm saying? Um, and that's one thing I can be proud of. You know, I've also always tried to give people a chance. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? A lot of people came to me at the, at the earliest stages of their career. You know what I'm saying? Um, really trying to get it, you know, and. I saw a lot of promise in a lot of people, you know, but sometimes they ain't had the right people around them. Yeah. In the cash money situation, they had the artists with the talent and they had the ownership that was willing to do what it took to make it work because they saw a big picture for themselves. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so with that, it was just about really nurturing the talent, which typically don't happen on an independent label because they don't have the money and the time. Cash Money had a different situation than that. They had the money, they had the time to work on the talent and build the talent up to the level that they needed him to be at. And so instead of just consistently just trying to put music out, music out, music out initially, they put a little something out. Then they said, okay, let's work on that a little bit. You know, because there was the BGs, right? And then as they brought in Juvenile, okay, Brought in uh, Turk. Okay, hold up. Maybe we can make this work. Now we got the high boys. Okay. Let, I think some of these dudes, like Juvenile was always going to be a solo artist because he had a career before the high boys. But now it's like, okay, Juve really on fire. That's you with that big body bend, huh? That's you that can't keep old lady because you keep yelling the friends, huh? Let's get that solo album going for Juve right now. At the same time, we need to start working on Wayne. Wow. You start working on Wayne. You know what I'm saying? While they're working on Wayne, they realizing BG, BG's ready too. You know what I'm saying? Let's be prepared for that. Now they understand the system and the industry. Now we can, shit, if we, we know how to sell music. We know how to get talent. We know how to work with talent. We know how to make the right music and sell the music. Shit, let's start doing some R&B. Let's, you know what I'm saying? Let's, let's fuck with reggae, all right? Let's touch all of this type of shit. Once a hustler understand the hustle and master it, the world is in his palms. And that's really what happened. But it was always about working with the talent and allowing the talent to build itself up to the right place. Not just taking somebody raw and just throwing them out to the wolves. Wow. When you talk about, you know, branching off to different, especially genres and stuff like that, I think about when we were, we play UGK all the time. And recently, I was I heard a song with um, Sean Kingston. Yeah, gangster. And I'm like, I love that beat. I love that. And I even I said, I said, Pimp wasn't on it. Pimp was in prison at that time when this happened. Yeah, that was my solo album. That was, that was my solo album. So yeah, the Pimp was locked up. So if you listen to the song, you hear me saying free Pimp. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So what? I, what I wanted to know is that if he was out, do you think he would have jumped on that? He would have done something like that? Because <laughs> when I think about Pimp and the type of songs that I've heard, uh, it's always, always so Texas, so South, so I love everything. It. So, so, <laughs> so when we, so I was in a group called PA Militia, mm -hmm. and Pimp was in a group with Mitchell Queen, and they were the original version of UGK. We combined those two groups and created a group called 4BM. Mm -hmm. was for black ministers and the whole thing about it was making reggae music over i mean making gangster music over reggae music over roots reggae so the original version to tell me uh, of um cocaine in the back of the ride is a bob marley song really but rita wouldn't clear it because we were talking about cocaine 
And she said, Bob, and I like cocaine. Right. Said, if you want to do weed, and weed. And she was like, you want to do weed in the car? <laughs> yeah, that's do fine. weed in the car, but Bob, and I like cocaine, right. so you can't use Bob's music right. to represent cocaine. I, I get it. I didn't even know, I didn't that. know that. I didn't either. That's yeah, but, but that was the whole thing of us creating like a whole album of music, you know, gangster street music, but built around reggae. Because yeah. we were big reggae fans. I'm a huge Steel Pulse fan. You know what I'm wow. saying? So, and Steel Pulse was actually, a, you know, reggae mm -hmm. and, and especially dance hall had a very strong movement in Houston from like, I would say 90 till about 94. I know this little girl, her name is Maxine. Like right, it was very, very dominant in the city of Houston. The old hottest club in the city at the time we was, were making music was called was Jamaica, Travis? Jamaica. Oh, okay. It was called Jamaica, Jamaica, Jamaica. Jamaica okay. right? And that wow. was the best club in the city. And you would go there and they would play reggae music all night and then they would do a rap set mm. for like 45 minutes to an hour and then get right back to the reggae. But we liked it. It was a cool vibe. It was chill. They had pool tables in there. You know, and women dance different to reggae music, Jamaican women specifically. That's right, so that's right. we ain't had no problem with that. Oh, man. But it was a cool place for everybody to congregate, you know. And and so no, Jamaican music and Jamaican culture has always been prevalent yeah. in Houston. Um, even still is now to me because even um I think they have a reggae or reggae concert that they do every year. Ever since I've been here and I've been in the States 20, 21 years and I've always heard everybody from Dallas who I know Jamaican wise, Caribbean wise, mm -hmm. go to Houston yeah. and pack this place out yeah, for do. this concert and it comes once a year and yeah. it's always like the biggest thing. Wow. No, and there's a lot of Jamaican influence in the city of Houston, Houston too. Yeah, no, for sure. It's always been mm -hmm. represented in the city of Houston and Houstonians know, right? Yeah. Especially people from my generation. Like they you know. saw real Jamaicans in the club, not not like people that Americans. grew dread. No, no, not just people that grew people dread. That grew dread. Like real yes. rosters, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Mm. Yeah, I want to ask you, I want to go back to the, uh, I want to go back to the Cash Money days and talk about Manny Fresh because I seen he had said one time when I was watching him away a while back, it was like, I think it was the policeman or, or your friends, he, he called you to get your approval to use a sample of that for, I think it was back that thing up, wasn't it? I, I, I'm not sure. It was, it was something from that songs. era. It was yeah. from that era. I can't remember. Like, I'm going like, to have to call I, man I thought that was that. respect, man. I'm like, man, he bought really show respect with, and, and early on in the music. Well, Manny and one had a very good relationship, right? Um, you know, I met Manny initially. We, we met, all met together. We had a big show at USL. It was okay. too short. It was uh, Ron C. Yeah, Dallas, Ron back C. For sure. Um, this was back when Manny was with Gregory D. Yeah, Gregory so D. They was on the show, and I think Baby and Slim had UNLV at the time, mm -hmm. right? And so we all met at that show. That's when they actually approached Manny about doing some music with him. So when I first started to go to New Orleans to meet with Baby and Slim, it would be me, Slim, Baby, Manny, and BG as a kid, kid yeah. right? That's who would pull up the peaches. We would all be in Manny and Paula back then. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's hard, man. Yeah, we on Boss Talk 101. 101. Yeah, we gonna talk.